Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen. Our text for this morning is Romans chapter 15, verse 4. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures we might have hope. Here ends our text. Please be seated. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. And here, of course, of course, Paul is talking about what we refer to as the Old Testament Scriptures. The Old Testament Scriptures. And if you go back and read through the Old Testament Scriptures, you see how God cared for His people. How He protected them. How He watched over them. How He encouraged them. How He forgave them through the Messiah who was yet to come. There's a lot there. A lot of wonderful promises that God made to his people. And when God makes a promise, he keeps a promise. And as we live out these Advent days, then think about John the Baptist, who was privileged to proclaim that the Messiah was on the scene, about to show up. What a wonderful thing to see God fulfill in his promise. Promise made to Adam and Eve. Promise renewed to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And to King David. To others. God repeated that message. That one would come to save them. And we're privileged to look back at history and see that God did fulfill that promise, that God did send His Son to come and save us. So for whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures we might have hope. Now, of course, the pastor is always supposed to say, "Uh, you folks should read your Bible more. And you should. And I should read my Bible more, even though I spend a fair amount of time reading the Bible. I should still read it more. But it's not some burden. It's like my wife saying to me, oh, honey, dinner's ready or dessert's ready. Oh, gee, do I have to eat again? No. It's a gracious invitation to come and eat. And that's what God is extending to all of us. Come and eat. Taste the word. Take it in. Because in that word there is encouragement. Encouragement. Like this little gem from Psalm 50. And call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. That is an encouraging word. Call upon me in the day of trouble. If you're breathing, you've got troubles. If you're not breathing, you have troubles of a different type. But if you're breathing, you've got troubles. If you're alive, you've got troubles. There's always trouble. The world doesn't seem to have any lack of trouble. Things uh, assault and assail us from all sides. Whether it's the devil, the world, or our own sinful flesh always seems to want to drag us down and push us down, demoralize us, discourage us. We have trouble. And hear this beautiful word from Psalm 50. And call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. It's kind of odd, that last bit. And you shall glorify me. Where and how is God most glorious? Where can you really see the glory of God? Well, at the cross. 
It doesn't seem very glorious. It, it, it seems harsh and crude and ugly and cruel. Blood and pain and sweat. Death. But that is in fact where God is the most glorious. That's where we really see the true heart of God. Because that's where God is doing what he really needs to do to be a loving God. And that is to rescue his people. To save his people. To fulfill his promise of deliverance. That's how he's glorified. And when he rescues us, we glorify him because we have been rescued. That's God being God. Pulling us up out of the pit. Oh, that's an interesting memory just popped in my head. When we were kids, we used to, this is really bad. We would um, we'd play army. I, I guess it's not politically correct anymore, but we would play army. And uh, my dad had a purple heart, and so we used to take his purple heart and, and, and sexist as we were, the, the, the girls were nurses and we were soldiers, and we would get wounded. And we'd take my dad's purple heart and we'd pin it on whoever was wounded. And the older kids actually dug, dug a pit. And they put thorns in the pit. <laughs> and the other bad part about where we played army was it was very close to the train tracks. Now, think about young children playing army with dug pits, thorns near a train track. And of course, one of the kids, you know, if you put your head on the rail, <coughs> you can hear the train coming from a long way off. Well, of course you can, because it's just right there, but he was facing the wrong way. And we watch, and we laugh, and we watch, and we laugh, and they were like, well, it's getting louder, guys. And we're going, yeah, no kidding, it's right there. So we went and we rescued him. But if you were bad and you became a prisoner of war, you would get thrown in that pit. I can remember people taking me to that pit and, and getting me right off the edge, and I'd look down, and I'm a little kid, and it's deep, and there's thorns and things, and they wouldn't really push me in. It was the threat. But it's a bad thought. Even 55, 56, 57 years later, that's a bad thought to be thrown into a pit. But see, God rescues us from whatever pit we're in. Whatever weight our sins are causing, pushing us down. Whatever people are throwing at us that's making our lives miserable, God rescues us from that. God encourages us. God forgives us. And so the greatest weight of all is removed, the burden and weight of our own sins, our own disobedience, our independence, our free thinking, whatever. God rescues. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. Like the call button, you ever been in a hospital? <clears throat> Who's been in the hospital? You ever visited anybody in the hospital? Have you ever driven by a hospital? <laughs> Do you know what a hospital is? <clears throat> if you're in a bed in a hospital, you know it too well. If, if, you, if you're in a hospital bed, they take a little white cord that has a little cone at the top with a red button on it. It's the modern style. And the nurses tie that to the side of your bed or they pin it to your cushion. Call upon me in the day of trouble. That's what it's for. If your pain's getting bad, if you need something, if you're thirsty, if your machine's beeping, you hit that button. And someone comes and literally rescues you. And that's what God is saying to each and every one of us. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. Encouragement. Encouragement from God's words like John pens in his first epistle, chapter 2. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. That's the reason and cause of John's writing to them, to encourage them. I'm writing to you because your sins are forgiven. I want to remind you again and again and again that God loves you and that God has forgiven you all your sins. 
That's the encouraging word we get from God. And Paul writes in Romans chapter 1, For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. And you may start to think, well, what kind of spiritual gift is he? Some miraculous thing? That is, he goes on in verse 12, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. That's the gift he wants to impart. He is coming as a Christian person who has faith. He wants to meet up with them to encourage them. And you know how it is, and that's why you're here. And one of the reasons you're here is to be encouraged by one another. And you know how encouraging it is when you, you meet someone and they start talking about their Christian faith. And you're, well, I'm a Christian too, or vice versa. It's encouraging. That's what Paul wanted to do for the Romans. I want to come to you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. Because, one, it's encouraging to meet other Christian people, and two, they can teach you something. They can teach you something. Or you can teach them something. And it's encouraging to meet other Christian people, people who believe just as you believe. Back in... Don't nail me down on the month. It was July or August of 1974. And I was meeting a sibling and some friends in Grayling, Michigan. Some of you do know where Grayling, Michigan is. Well, we were going to rent some canoes and spend four or five days canoe camping. But none of us had been to Grayling's before, and I was up in the upper, or going to be up in the upper peninsula of Michigan. (laughs) The others were coming down from the southern part of the state. So I said to a friend of mine, we're going to meet up in Grayling and the canoe rental place is a bit out of town and we, we want to meet in town. For, is there any place you know that, like in Grayling, that, that we could meet? This fellow had spent lots of time up there. He was a hunter. He knew the area. He looked at me and said, well, sure. Meet at Spikes. I said, Spikes? He said, yeah, meet at Spikes Keg and Nails. I said, okay, sounds like a bar. Yeah. He said, I said, well, you know, can we get directions? Can we find this the way before the days of cell phones, GPS devices, anything? We, we would glance at the map that our parents had, and then we'd get out in the car and leave for days. Stupid. <laughs> so, is spikes hard to find? And my friend said to me, ask anybody. Anywhere around there, within an hour's drive of grailing, they'll be able to tell you where Spike's keg of nails is. I said, okay. So predetermined meeting date and time. I came from up north. They came from the south. Pulling the parking lot at Spike's keg of nails after driving hours by myself. Michigan's a fairly big state. And I'm sitting in the parking lot wondering, and then I see my truck, because I was driving my car. I see my truck pull up, I think with my brother driving, and I thought, oh, cool, that's encouraging. I knew where to meet him, and he showed up, because he's dependable, and I was encouraged. But this is somewhere we'd never been before. And sometimes life feels like that. You're somewhere where you, you, you just don't feel... Like you know what's going on. Like you don't, you're not quite in, in, in sync. You're not quite in the groove. Some things are unknown. It's, it's like a new job or a start of a new relationship or an interesting situation, a place you've never been. It's encouraging to have someone you know show up and say, it's going to be okay. We're here. We, we found the campsite already, which they had, in fact, and my timing was perfect. I got there and the tents were all set up. That's what Paul wanted to do for the people at Rome, to meet them, to encourage them, to help them, to guide them. That's why God gives us fellow believers. And why he gives us his word. And why he calls us to worship. So we can be encouraged and fortified in the knowledge 
that God is true to his promises, that he did send his son Jesus the Christ into this world to be our brother and savior, that he did bleed and die, and that he rose again from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, in him we do have hope, now and forever. Be encouraged. Amen. Please stand. Now may the peace of God which passes all of our human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.